pray then and uh, we will begin. Uh, I would like to request uh, somebody who hasn't prayed yet in this class to please pray. Mm. Anyone want to volunteer? Okay, um, I'm just seeing your name. So, anyone here? Uh, maybe Mangi. Mangi, would you like to lead in prayer? Yes, Pastor. Yes. Okay, let's pray. Yeah. Holy Father, we thank you, Lord, for, for this morning. Thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to, to come learn more about your kingdom, Lord, and that. Uh, the authority and the way you manifest, Lord, your glory and your power, Lord, through us on the earth. We pray Jesus that you open our minds, you prepare our mind and our hearts, Lord, to receive whatever we learn today, Lord, so that we may be equipped, Lord, to, to shine your glory and to be an example, Lord, of how your kingdom will look and how you, how you operate, Lord, so that other people can see you through us, Lord. Empower Pastor Nancy this morning. Give her wisdom, Lord, and give her utterance, Lord, so that whatever she teaches, Lord, go through our heart, our mind. In your mighty name, Father, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Mangi. Um, so, in the last class, I know we ended with a good discussion about uh, God's authority in the family structure. And uh, basically, uh, you know, husband and wife. So there were some queries and we uh, you know, discussed about that. So we will pick up from there. Uh, we are still in the family structure. So we discussed about husband and wife um, and, you know, how the um, uh, authority looks. Basically, we said they're co-equal, but um, there is a flow of authority uh, through the the husband so the structure is like the uh, christ is ahead and then then uh, the husband and then the wife and uh, uh, we basically talked about spiritual headship and what uh, that really means so uh, continuing from there in the family we also know that uh, there are parents and children okay so, um, and there are so many scriptures to, to clearly show us that the parents are the authority over the children. And even when we studied about um, prayer, prayer and uh, prayer and intercession, if you all recall, we talked about how a person who is spiritual in the household has influence over the uh, family members. So anyone who's born again, we have spiritual influence over the children. And if you are a parent, then you have influence, spiritual influence over the children. So the authority flows from God through the parents to the children. And that's how it works. And, uh, you know, we, we're told uh, children are instructed to uh, obey their parents so that it would go well with them, so that they will have long life, uh, that they will experience God's blessings. Uh, and at the same time, uh, you know, uh, parents, like fathers are instructed, like Ephesians 6 talks about it, fathers are instructed to lead the children without hurting them or, you know, without, it's just provoking. So basically, when it comes to nurture, um, we want to see growth in the child, uh, but not, you know, um, uh, that people might think that, okay, disciplining them very strictly and and things like that will bring about growth uh, yes discipline is required but we are told not to break their spirit okay so uh, there's a very uh, fine balance there as well so you discipline the child you train you instruct the child lead the child in the ways of the lord uh, but at the same time you know um, don't hurt them or don't uh, destroy their spirit so in this manner uh, god wants us to see that authority flow in the family structure uh, between 
parents and children uh, and we we also notice in the book of uh, malachi in fact god says that uh, if the hearts of the children are turned towards the fathers and vice versa the hearts of the fathers are turned towards the children then you know there is a blessing for that but if it's the other if if there is no um uh you know what what do you call it like uh, if if they are against each other you know, fathers and children if they are against each other in fact you know god is not very happy about that so malachi 4:6 uh, very strictly god, uh, the word of god declares that uh, you know you be smitten with a curse and things like that but uh, uh, basically the point is that the uh, parents and the children must learn to uh, to like respect each other and uh, uh, live in unity okay uh, and you know, have the authority structure flow in the way god has instructed so that's a little bit about the structure in the family uh, and we can go on to the next uh, structure here which is god's authority in the local church so any any questions any thoughts about uh, parents and children okay um, yeah christopher is asking page number uh, page number 51 i just finished 51 christopher moving to page 52 yeah any anything about parents children okay uh, everyone seems to be very clear on this so yeah we'll move on but if you do feel that uh, you need to clarify something uh, we can always take it up towards the end so uh, now in the local church uh, it's clear that the pastor the spiritual leaders are positioned to uh, release the authority of god and it flows through them in the uh, church so acts chapter 20 when um, uh, paul was talking to the ephesian church um, he instructs them and i will read it for you. it's it's really um, helpful to read this passage from verse 28 to verse 30 therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the holy spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of god which he purchased with his own blood for I know this that after my departure savage wolves will come in among you not sparing the flock also from among yourselves men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves so Paul is very clearly um, charging the shepherds and we know the shepherd of the church is uh, we've seen right episcopal uh, episcopos like we we've seen that you know god has position uh, these leaders pastors uh, over the church so he is addressing them and he is saying that who is assigned them as leaders over the church he says the holy spirit has made you okay so uh, again leadership uh, in the church it's not you know a matter of just people deciding okay who's who's talented enough who has leadership skills let them lead uh, it's more than that because we know that the church has a spiritual dimension while it also has a natural dimension so how is leadership in the church determined we see here that the holy spirit has made you so by the instruction of the holy spirit and the other word to note here is overseer okay so overseer uh of course we've um, seen that word when we have studied um the structures that is episcopos right bishops so uh, that's what it means from the greek word episcopos overseers and uh when he's talking he says overseers to shepherd so to shepherd includes uh, to nurture to um, protect right to feed things like that so there is a responsibility of the shepherd when um, he's taking care of god's people and god's people here are referred to as the flock so it it's just that parallel so that people will understand so uh, the 
pastor is the shepherd of the church and he also says that this church uh, was bought uh, by the blood of jesus christ so uh, it's like you know the way we look at this is um uh you know you could you could see it like a uh hired help kind of a thing uh, because when when you when you have let's say you have a garden it's your garden and you have uh, invested so much to actually uh, tend that garden and it's beautiful uh, you bring in somebody to kind of care for it when you're not around or even when you're around you know you have uh, entrusted it to someone to take care of it so it is like that so the church uh, we, uh, we we can talk about this later you know house of god and again we are doing kingdom builders here whose church is it you know my church your church uh, things like that come up in the conversation but uh, actually it's the church of the lord jesus christ so none of us can can say oh this is my church no the holy spirit has made us an overseer uh, to shepherd the church of god and who is it he purchased with his own blood so the church belongs to god and you know paul is talking to uh, the the believer the uh, leaders here and he's saying that you must take care of what god has entrusted to you and uh, in, in terms of protecting the church you know he says that uh, people will rise up uh, false people will rise up so uh, beware of false doctrine beware of those who cause division strife things things like that so he instructs them so there is a responsibility of the uh, pastor or the leader over the church okay uh, but at the same time there are lots of passages in scripture that also talk about those who are being um, uh, you know those who are cared for responding well to the leaders so uh, hebrews 13 verse 17 it says obey those who rule over you and be submissive for they watch over watch out for your souls as those who must give account let them do so with joy and not with grief for that would be unprofitable for you so when there is oversight provided by the uh, pastor or the spiritual leader the church is expected to respond um, uh, with cooperation right uh, 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 joyfully respond to the leaders and of course you know the the uh, attitude of the leader that is understood you know we we are not supposed to lord over uh, the um, sheep that god has entrusted to us so uh, when the leaders have the right attitude the uh, flock is also encouraged to have the right attitude one of honor so basically both sides similarly in the marriage honor husband wife honor parents children honor so uh, when we talk about authority structures there's also this this um, um even though it may not be specified or i'm not specifying it here uh, there is honor that is required on both sides so uh, those who are following they are asked to obey the leaders okay and uh, there are you know other passages we want to read it but again first thessalonians 5 verses 12 to 13 is something that you can refer to where again uh, the uh, people of the church they are asked to submit and give honor to the leaders you know who work hard for them um, uh, then you know moving on to um, uh, first peter yeah first peter also uh, has a passage which says that uh, uh, those who are leaders right so this is an instruction to the leaders how should we lead god's people or uh, when i um, desire to be a pastor or an elder uh, in the church what kind of a uh, service and attitude is expected from me so uh, peter writes and he says that you know we must we must serve willingly okay we must serve god's people willingly uh, and he also says don't do it for dishonest gain don't do it for monetary benefits okay because sometimes it can be looked at as a, oh this is a very lucrative uh, opportunity but no we are warned against that and uh, we are very clearly told that those who are leaders uh, in the house of god we need to do it with the right heart attitude and uh, peter also says don't lord over god's people but rather lead as examples uh, examples 
um, to the people of God. So these are the instructions that are applicable to those who are leaders in God's house. Uh, and those who, um, like in God's house, this is the authority structure, but also like Peter does talk about the younger people uh, in church honoring the older folk as well. So you, you see uh, that uh, submission also coming in. But at the same time, he does say that, you know, walk uh, submitting to one another. So there's uh, basically a culture of honor that needs to be maintained in the local church. Now, when we uh, move in this way, right, with honor, with submission, with unity, um, with, uh, you know, uh, our, actually the submission that we have for people, uh, it is in submission to God. Peter writes about that. He says, look, because you submit to God, you submit to uh, the authorities that God has put in position. And when we do this, you know, what happens when there is unity, when there is cohesiveness? You know, scriptures tell us that God commands a blessing where there is unity. Okay, so uh, God is faithful. Like when we follow his authority structure, there is blessing. So that's a, a little bit about the authority structure of the local church. Um, any any uh, additional thoughts or comments there? Yeah. About the local church and the leadership. Uh, uh, Pastor? Yes, yes, Nangi. I know we've, we've learned this before, but... Mm. Uh, Earlier on, you said there's a spiritual and physical aspect of the church. Mm. Can you please just uh, explain mm. a little bit about that, please? Thank you. Okay, sure. Yeah, Manny, thank you. So um, the spiritual aspect is that, um, okay, we, we are the body of Christ, right? So we, we talked about that. We are the body of Christ. We are a part of the kingdom of God. These are all things that we can't see, okay? Uh, but that is a spiritual aspect. However, uh, the, the natural aspect is whatever can be seen uh, or whatever can be released through the local church. So that is the natural aspect. Yeah, so uh, is, that, uh, is that answering your question, Mangi? Yes, Pastor. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, any, anything else that uh, you want to clarify? Okay. So, uh, yeah, you could uh, just you know, think it through and if at all you, you have anything to ask. Can always um, uh, share towards the end. Okay, now uh, God's authority structure in the body of Christ. Uh, there's a passage in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, uh, uh, it's verse 28, okay, where uh, we read God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. So even in the fivefold office offices um, that Christ has given as gifts to the church for the equipping of the saints, we notice that uh, there's a mention of the apostles as first. So what does it mean? Does it mean that anyone who has the anointing uh, uh, an apostolic anointing is better than someone who has uh, the prophetic anointing or you know, any other anointing, maybe a teaching anointing, um, a pastoral anointing. So is it about a particular anointing being better than the others? Okay. Uh, so the answer is no, because the first there used uh, in, in this passage is from the Greek word called proton, okay, which basically means first in time or first in order, first in rank or in importance. So when we study about the 
apostolic i think you have that in your second year uh, you would also see that an apostle is somebody who generally moves into a territory first so they are uh, the ones who extend the kingdom of god they uh, think of new uh, uh, you know new um, uh, you know ideas creative ideas they they think of uh, uh, you know new zones where you could step in so they sort of initiate it okay and the rest of the the team follows so once the uh, apostle has gone in for example apostle paul right he would go uh, to different regions and he would preach the gospel there and you would have people saved and churches established and then he moves on from there so in that manner apostle uh, is called first uh, not because apostle is better than the other offices but simply because it is first in time order than rank so uh, with this understanding you know we uh, we can conclude that again the fivefold ministry offices they are co equal okay and they're all uh, they're all serving god and uh, it's not that god is saying you know one anointing is better than the other or anything like that so uh, when it comes to ministries when it comes to the gifts that we have again it's not a question of uh, trying to compete and see right that who uh, who uh, needs to be honored over the others so if we work in this manner we will will uh, you know truly serve god's purpose and also we have to recognize that these specifically about the fivefold offices that these offices are meant to serve okay so uh, in ephesians 4 again verses 11 and 12 we see that god has given these fivefold ministry uh, gifts so that the saints are prepared for the work of the ministry so it's for the sake of service now when we are serving uh, and we have the heart of service where is the question of i'm better than you you should get uh, i should get the honor i should get the respect none of that so uh, when it comes to these annoying things uh, again you know we see structure there we see a structure uh, the apostle is called as the proton okay so that is kind of the authority structure there all right now uh, moving forward the authority structure for a workplace um, and you know there are scriptures uh, that uh, teach us to honor um, you know those above us so in the times in the bible times it was more like master bond servant but it's not applicable for us anymore uh, it's generally employer employee relationship we know that we are supposed to honor the ones uh, who are above us so ephesians 6 was five bond servants be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in sincerity of heart as to christ okay so uh, it describes it uh, further describes the attitude that we must have an attitude where we are doing our work not just for the employer but it's at, it's unto the law okay so um, with that attitude we are supposed to serve our employers now again you know in first peter there's more about it uh, where we are told uh, that you know sometimes some of the the masters are not kind okay but still you know you have the right attitude you serve with the right attitude and uh, we see in the examples of people uh, in in the bible that's joseph okay who um, obviously he didn't have everything going well and he wasn't treated very well uh, in, in the places where he worked but as long as he was faithful to god you know god brought the increase god brought the blessing in his life and we know how he progressed from uh, uh, not not uh, being i mean being in the unknown to uh, sort of uh, being out there as the leader of a nation so god can do that but we are being called to faithfulness we are being called to honor our um, employers or the people that we work for and uh, uh, david is also another example uh, at during his time saul was the one who came before david he was anointed before david and uh, david had many opportunities to 
put down Saul. Uh, David could have, uh, um, you know, he he could have uh, 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 condemned Saul, right? Because he had experienced uh, a lot of injustice from Saul. But still, you see that David ran for his life. He protected himself, but he never really uh, let Saul down. Okay. Uh, and we, we know that you know God blessed him in his lifetime also and David did so well and uh, God is the one who exalted him. So we see this in the Old Testament and in the New Testament there is encouragement for those who are uh, under, those who come under you know, bosses, uh, leaders, employers for us to serve well as if we are serving God, not as I service but you know we are doing it for the Lord. So, uh, you know, when we incorporate this, uh, in fact, Christian, um, uh, Christian people in the workplace, you know, we, we should be the best example, okay? Uh, and that's what we are called to. So this is God's government. There is uh, the authority which uh, is um, given by God in the workplace, uh, and we must respect that. Okay, then there's the authority structure for civil government. Um, and this is also quite clear. Now we know that uh, uh, Jesus, you know, he when he was uh, asked the trick question about the, the coin, he says, Who, "Whose image do you see on that coin? Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar." So honoring the government, honoring the authority structure that God has put in place uh, over us in our city, in our land, uh, that uh, that is. Um, you know, a godly thing to do. Uh, and how do we do that? We do that by keeping the, the laws. We do that by paying our taxes. Okay, uh, So we do that by doing our duties uh, and responsibilities, taking up our responsibilities as the citizens of that land. Uh, and Paul encouraged the believers. Romans 13, 1, he said, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. So we must recognize that the authorities there are, are from God. Whether we like them or we don't like them, you know, that's another question. But we are supposed to honor every authority. Why? Because uh, authorities are appointed by God. Okay. Uh, so yeah, and there are lots of other passages that that talk about authorities. Uh, and in fact, you know, if you look at the kind of authority the Roman Empire, the Roman government uh, that Paul came under, it, it's amazing that he even wrote this, right? Because they were they were brutal, and uh, they were, uh, I, I mean. It's it's terrible, you know, the way they dealt with people in those times. And yet, you know, Paul recognizes that the civil authority uh, uh, above him uh, is appointed by God. So we must respect it. Okay. And uh, like, I mean, I am just wondering when Paul was tried, they found it hard to find a reason against him. So, you know, his trial kept moving from uh, one court to the next court to the next court. Uh, and even when he was in Rome, he was there for a while, okay, because they, they wanted to find a reason against Paul, but he was a law-abiding citizen, okay, so he honored the law of the land. Uh, so in that manner, you know, we are called to respect the government system, respect the uh, governmental authority over us, okay, and we are also encouraged to pray, to pray for uh, the government. This is in First Timothy 2 verses 1 through 3 where uh, we are told that it is our responsibility right, as uh, believers to pray for our government. Now, um, uh, yeah, so that's about the government. Now, what to do if uh, the government has rules uh, that may cause us to go away from God's word? Okay. Uh, now, clearly, when, when we are called to do something against God, you have the examples of people like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? So they said, you have to bow down before this idol. And all. they said, no, sorry, we can't do that. Okay. So if we are called to do something against God, we see even from the New Testament, this is when um, 
Peter and John, they are warned. They go and heal a lame man uh, in, in Acts 3 and Acts 4. They were caught and they were interrogated. They were threatened, severely threatened and said, look, if you preach in the name of Jesus, then this is it. Like we're warning you. But they, they knew that they have to follow God. So in Acts 4.19, uh, Peter and John answered, they said, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. Okay. So they were clear on their convictions. They were clear uh, on, um, you know, their allegiance in that sense. Uh, that if we are asked to do something against God, then sorry, no, we can't do that. Okay, um, and again, there's another incident. This is in Acts 5, uh, where, uh, you know, once again, they're asked to not serve this Jesus. So uh, they clearly respond. They say, we ought to obey God rather than men. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so in the, in the event of the government asking us to do something against God, uh, it's pretty clear cut that we are supposed to follow God. Yeah, so I think uh, this kind of covers all the key things uh, about government. Uh, and we can also remember that uh, through history, no matter which government is in place, uh, we've seen that God's purposes are accomplished, right? So uh, even though Pharaoh was... Uh, his heart was hard and he was not willing to let the people go. You know, God did miracles. God, God knew, right, how to bring the people out. So God is able to do that. We as God's people, we can continue to pray for the government. We can continue to pray for uh, the kingdom of God to come in our land, uh, right, so on and so forth. So uh, God can, God can still work if the government is unwilling, right, about uh, certain matters. Uh, but yes, we are called to respect the government, honor the government, uh, and to uh, abide by the law you know, to the best of our abilities. Whenever we do that, we relate rightly to all the, um, not just the, the government structure, but all the structures, all the authority structures. Uh, you know, God has put it in place for a reason, right? And he tells us, this is the order. So whenever we follow the order, there is a blessing in it, okay? And things go well. So that's about the flow of uh, authority in different settings. Uh, at this point, are there any, okay, Beth has a question here. She says, local church is the body of Christ. So how do we marry the authority structure of local church with body of Christ? Where does the apostle link with the local pastor if they are different people? Okay, very, very good question, uh, um, Ben. Yes, so you, we uh, know that the local church is a part of the body of Christ. So the local church is supposed to respect uh, the fivefold ministry offices. So out there in the body of Christ, we have apostles. Now the leader of the local church, who is the pastor, that person will decide, okay, how he would like to link with the apostle. Now, if he himself has an apostolic calling, then, you know, he leads the church. Uh, but otherwise, uh, you know, he, he may uh, consult with the apostle, invite the apostle, uh, maybe some of the teachings, right, of the, of the apostle um, can... Uh, can be given at the church. So there are many ways, Beth. There are many ways. So the pastor can, the, the key thing is that the pastor has to respect that apostolic calling and be led by God. As, an, as the Holy Spirit leads, he can connect with the apostle. Does that answer your question? Sort of. <laughs> okay, Beth. Yeah. Okay, what better example can I give? Okay, who identifies who the apostle is in the church setting? 
Okay, so we generally say this that uh, usually to identify a calling, uh, we can observe. Okay, then we are actually saying the apostle is head. No, that's not what we are saying. We are not saying the apostle is head. We are saying recognize every anointing in the body of Christ. Similarly, if the pastor, like the pastor can uh, honor the apostolic calling, which is in the, in the body of Christ, the pastor can honor the prophetic calling, which is in the body of Christ. The pastor can honor the, the, the teaching calling, which is out there, right? So uh, basically, see, the pastor will not behave like, yeah, we, we are a bubble by ourselves and nobody else exists because there are moves of God. Right in the body of Christ, and you uh, you will study that in revivals. You will study that uh, in church history. So God is, you know, there is this whole dynamic that that is happening in the entire body of Christ. Now it's only when the local pastors, right, they are in tune with that, that we can all move together. Okay, so which is why that link that you talked about that needs to be there, but how? That link is established, it varies from church to church, how they deal with the fivefold ministry offices. And ideally, every church uh, should have all the fivefold ministry offices function anyway. But you know, there are, there are uh, so many others in the body of Christ. So we establish a good community, good fellowship with them. And whatever uh, God is doing in the apostolic realm, in the prophetic realm, we receive those things. Okay, so uh, that's the context in which I was talking about it. Now, your question about uh, identif how, who identifies the apostle. So we generally say this, right? That as one is serving over time, the anointing becomes clearer. So uh, we would judge on the basis of what ministry is being accomplished through that individual's life. So, uh, you know, who identifies an apostle? I'm just giving you an example. If I call myself, you know, Apostle Nancy, nothing wrong with it. If, if, I all, if God has already spoken to me about it, then I want to call myself apostle. Uh, but the better way is that I would do what I'm called to do. Okay, maybe for months, maybe for years together. And eventually what happens? People around me recognize the anointing on my life. So whether I call myself a prophet or a teacher or a, an apostle or an anything, people will call me that. Right? So the, the church as such begins to recognize, wow, this person carries this particular anointing. And that's a better way. So who identifies? I think you should let the ministry kind of uh, uh, define your role. And it happens over time. Okay, and I, I hope that answers your question. Um, then the church setting. And we are actually saying the apostle is there. Yeah, I, I think I have uh, touched on all your questions, Beth. Uh, uh, would that be okay? Or is that is there something specific you're, you're trying to get at? Okay, sure, sure. Okay, thank you, Beth. Thank you. Okay, and Rose, uh, apostles plant the church and the local pastors who are called to serve a certain congregation that the apostles might have planted are the ones who nourish their, these born again flocks. Apostles can come and go. The pastors are rooted in a certain place. Yes, you're, you're right, uh, Rose. So the pastoral calling is to tend the sheep, is to take care of the sheep. And which is why a pastor is usually um, uh, like he's, he's committed to that body. So you won't find him leaving that body and uh, traveling around, even if he is traveling around. See, uh, there's also this aspect that an individual can have multiple callings. So you are, you are, um, um, and what do you say? Like a prophetic, uh, prophetic pastor, apostolic, pastor right so you can have multiple anointings on the life of the same person so even if this person uh, let's say this person is just a pastor okay the anointing is only a pastor uh, and he teaches a little bit so he will be committed to the church even if he travels out for a while to teach he'll always come back because he needs to be there to take care of the 
church. But if someone has a, a, an apostolic calling, like Paul, yes, they will go all over the place, extend the territory, right? Go plant new churches, so on, and they may not necessarily keep coming back to a base church. But when they are through, uh, they might come back to that original uh, or whatever you want to call it. People call it the base church. So, yeah, that's right. Yes. So, okay, don't evangelists plant churches? Okay, so when it comes to planting churches, uh, where mm, what we observe uh, in the Bible is you don't really need a, um, or uh, I would put it as you don't see someone with a particular anointing doing it. For example, the Church of Antioch. Okay, the Church of Antioch. When you study who planted that church, you'd find that it was just some believers who got dispersed from the Church of Jerusalem uh, because of persecution. These were just believers. Like you don't even know their names, but they planted the church. So anybody can plant a church. So that includes evangelists. Why not? Anybody can plant a church. Okay, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any more uh, questions to or even your comments? You just want to make a point. All right. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, it's quite clear uh, the authority structures. We will uh, move on to the next chapter here in our notes. And this is about the literal kingdom. Okay. So here about the literal kingdom, because we're, we're discussing the kingdom of God, there's a question. The spiritual aspect, you know, the question that Nangi brought up, we are part of the kingdom of God. That also is a spiritual dimension. We don't see it in the natural realm, but we belong to the kingdom. But when will this spiritual kingdom uh, be, a nat be a, like a literal kingdom? There are lots of scriptures in the, in the Bible that talk about a time when the Lord Jesus will rule and reign from the earth. Okay, uh, and uh, you find even the disciples knowing this truth. So they ask Jesus before his ascension, they ask him, so when are you going to um, establish the kingdom? Okay, they ask him that question because in the teachings of Jesus also, he made it very clear that there is going to be a literal kingdom. Right now it's spiritual and we say kingdom of God, people from different languages, tribes, you know, it, it, there, there's no bound, physical boundary, but in a spiritual way, we are all connected. But there will be a time when there will be a literal kingdom on the earth. Okay, so um, there are many scriptures here. I think uh, I, I will not go into a lot of detail uh, in this chapter because in the second year, I know that you also have the end times where um, there will be good, you know, in that discussion about all these matters. Uh, so for, for our understanding here in the kingdom of God, uh, it's enough for us to know that God has planned a literal kingdom. And uh, it, there are prophecies after prophecies that talk about it. There is, uh, you know, Jacob's prophecy in Genesis 49 verse 10. It says, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes and to him shall be the obedience of the people. So as you, uh, uh, you look at the details of the, the terms that are mentioned, you know, lawgiver and Shiloh has to do with peace. Okay, we know Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Uh, and Judah, we know that the king has to come from the tribe of Judah. So there are prophecies that are pointing in that direction that the Lord Jesus will be ruler over the literal kingdom. And God has a covenant, right? God had a covenant with David and said that uh, they, he will not lack somebody on the throne. And God told him that your throne shall be 
established forever. So we know that God is going to position somebody uh, from the descendants of David as the ruler over his people. So there are, you know, ample prophecies, even in this chapter, if you just look at it, there's verse after verse that talks about the coming kingdom. So Isaiah foretold it, Daniel foretold it, right? So they all talked about it. Uh, and when uh, exactly is this kingdom going to come? Uh, we know who the king of the kingdom is, right? We know uh, that it's our God. And uh, uh, when Jesus was born, the angels came and they declared it. Now they said that uh, this is uh, the son of God, uh, this is Jesus, right? And then they clearly point out and they say, Lord will give him the throne of his father, David. So they have indicated, announced that this is the king of that kingdom, right? So the angels also made that announcement. And then, you know, um, we, we know that when the second coming happens, right? the second coming of the Lord Jesus happens, uh, he will overthrow uh, every other authority here on the earth and the kingdom of God will be established physically. Yeah, so I think I will just touch upon it in that manner uh, and wrap it up. Unless... Uh, sorry about getting disconnected. There's a uh, power cut here. So, yes, um, uh, if there's any question, we can take that up before we uh, wrap up the session. Okay. All right, so uh, let's do this then. Let's uh, go for a break now because we uh, are out of time and we'll come back in 10 minutes and we will continue. So see you all at uh, 11. Okay, thank you.